Hi folks, welcome to this supporters episode that has exclusive content for you to accompany my series Ireland's Last Aristocrat, The Life of Olive, Packing a Man. Now there's no spoilers in this, but it probably makes more sense if you listen to part one of the series before you get into this. In the making of that series, Ireland's Last Aristocrat, I actually spent two days in Olive Packin' and Mahan's home, that's Strokestown Park House, and I came away with about six hours of content. Even after I'd edited that down, I had way more than I could ever fit in one series. Pretty much everything that the historian you've heard from in the series, that's Oshin O'Driscoll, and the archivist Martin Fagan said, was absolutely fascinating. So in this exclusive show, you're going to hear more about the house itself, You'll also hear about Olive's parents, Henry and May. They're fascinating people in their own right, particularly Henry with his interest in photography. It's not what you expect to find in the west of Ireland, but we're going to learn more about that in this show. I also touch on hunting, fashion at the time, more about the legacy of the Great Famine, and we even finish up with a bit about the toys that Olive would have played with as a child. Before we start, I have two announcements for you as supporters. Don't forget, if you want to join me on the supporters trip to Conway Castle, it's on October the 8th and there's still time for you to book a place on that trip. Just get in touch with me. We're going to be visiting the stunning Conway Castle. It's a really incredible place. Now, if you're interested in joining me, I'd love for you to be there. Just get in touch with me at Patreon or at info at irishhistorypodcast.ie and I'll send you the details. I also just want to say thank you for supporting the show. This series was extremely time consuming to make and very expensive. The round trip to Strokestown was about 500 kilometres and that doesn't even factor in the weeks of editing the audio after I had it recorded, the voice actors, the sound work. It's all only possible because of your support. So thanks very much. I'll have a second bonus episode from Strokestown after the third part of the series and then we're going to be straight into the exclusive supporters series on the Civil War with Dr Brian Hanley from the History Department of Trinity College Dublin. So I have lots of content coming for you on Patreon or Acast Plus, whichever you're listening to this on in the next couple of months. Now to start this episode, I want to bring you right back to the start of my two days in Strokestown. Oshino Driscoll, the historian and guide who you heard from in part one of the series, began our journey through Olive's house and the grounds surrounding it, where you might expect, at the front door. But Oshin really captures Olive's home in this description. So the house is a Palladian-style 18th century house. It was designed by Richard Cassell, or Richard Castles, whose name you might know. He also designed Westport House and Rusborough House. He was German, but he lived in Ireland for a long time, designed a lot of these houses. And yeah, it's a very classic, you know, standard Palladian structure. You've got a big central block that's about three stories high. That is where the family would have lived, where they would have conducted their lives. And then you have these sweeping wings coming out on either side. One, this one here on our right, is actually part of the stables. It looks like it's part of the house, but really that's part of the stables. It's designed to give the appearance that it's connected to the house, but originally it wasn't at all. And then on our left, we have the kitchens. So this wing contains the kitchen. So the whole Palladian thing is designed to sort of, again, overawe you with its presence. So as you approach, it really surrounds you. And the house is designed to have as big and kind of imposing a presence as possible. Now, Strokestown itself lies just a few hundred metres away from where me and Oshin were standing. But in Olive's time, there was an invisible barrier between the house and the town. This was partly constructed by the Packin and Mahan family. We've heard in episode one how there was that reticence to associate with local people. But there was also a barrier that we heard about that was created by history. Now in part one I talked about Olive's great grandfather, that's Dennis Mahan, who was assassinated during the Great Famine. And before I continue I want to let Oshin explain more about that event. Dennis Mahan was shot amid rising tensions during the famine. He had paid for one-way tickets to North America for many of his tenants, although many of them did die en route. Now this offer of giving them free tickets to North America ostensibly seems like a generous offer, but as Oshin now explains, it's not that simple. But of course it wasn't purely humanitarian reasons, as many of your listeners will probably know. If those people had gone to the workhouse, under the poor laws, Dennis Mann would have been responsible through his rates for paying to feed them. We have an estimate that to do that, would have been a bill of somewhere in the region of £10,000 a year, whereas sending them to Canada was a one-off single payment of around £5,600. 
So it made clear economic sense for him. There's also, in his letters from the time, there's a lot of suggestion that he used this event as an opportunity to get rid of certain tenants that he already had a problem with, you know, that he considered that, in his opinion, were refusing to pay their rent because they were in secret societies, right, that protected them. So this is sort of almost like a precursor to land leagueism and what comes later in the century. As we continued our tour on that first day, Oshin brought me inside the front door of the house. You're immediately faced with a large marble table where members of the Pakenham Mahan family were actually laid out after they died for their wake. However, your eye is drawn upwards as you're watched by several stuffed animals hanging from the walls. These are hunting trophies. Yeah, so we've just come on through the front door of the house, so the entrance that would have been used by the family and by their guests. Obviously, the local people, the tenants and their servants would never have come through that door or really been in this part of the house very much at all. So we're in the front hall. As you can see, it's a hall with these bright red carpets and these nice decorative ceilings. And when you look straight ahead, you've got the grand staircase that curves upwards towards the first floor. And I, I suppose really the most striking thing in here is all the dead animals, because we have a huge collection of skulls, including bison, we have antelopes, we have deer antlers, we've stuffed hares. Obviously, that was a huge part of the culture of the Anglo-Irish aristocracy, was hunting, guns, riding, that whole lifestyle. And I mean, they would have travelled, as you can kind of guess from the things, to other countries to hunt and then to bring back uh, the remains, their trophies. These include, as Urshin now explains, animals from across the world, as far afield as Utah in the United States. You would have noticed there's a huge set of antlers that came off some kind of uh, stag, and it has a mark on it. I remember that's HPM, Henry Packham Mahan, Olive's father, uh, Utah, I think it says, 18. Easy possibly. But ultimately, the family did most of their hunting at home. And perhaps one of the things that conveys Olive's privileged upbringing, even if the family were in decline, was the reserved hunting grounds that they had at Strokestown Park House. They were bigger than most farms in Ireland, yet the pack of the Mahans left them idle just to hunt in. During Olive's childhood, there's this area of about, I think, close to 300 acres that was preserved. It was not for farming when Olive was a child. That was the deer park. They maintained a population of deer, specifically so they could go out and hunt. And you can see it if you stand behind the house or or from one of the rooms that looks out on it. And it is this, like, it's a really beautiful view, right? It's rolling hills. In the centre of it, very visible from the house, you have the ruins of a medieval church, which really stands out. And that was something they... We believe they rebuilt part of it, actually. We, we, parts of it definitely date back to the medieval period, the Middle Ages. Some of it probably was um, rebuilt or altered by the family to make it more noticeable. But, um, but yeah, so they would have had, like, guests come here. There would have been hunting parties. And, yeah, they would have been able to look down from the house or even from there's a tower in the gardens, which gives a huge, great view down across over all the land. In the main episode, we covered most of the rooms in the house, so I'm not going to go through them In this episode, obviously, we've been there. However, you may recall there was no mention of a ballroom. There's actually no ballroom in Strokestown Park House. Now, they're quite common in houses like this. The library did have the potential to double as one. But as Oshin now explains, steps were actually taken to prevent it ever being used as a ballroom. Another detail about this room, you'll notice, like, it's very big for a library. And we know that when the house was being built, Thomas Martin and his wife, there was some kind of a dispute between them because she wanted a ballroom. Understandably, the house doesn't have one. And this is a perfect ballroom. It's just the right size. And so apparently, as the building was being done, uh, Thomas went to the builders and told them to install the floor slightly differently to all the other ones. So if you compare it to the drawing room, you can see the way in the drawing room it's running... Uh, this way, and then it's uh, perpendicular, the floor in here. So this means if you were to dance in here, you'd have to dance against the grain of the wood, which is considered taboo. You're not allowed to do that. So by doing that, he made sure that you could never use this as a, as a ballroom, and he made sure that he got his, uh, his library. Olive's father, Henry, certainly emerged as an unusual character in the first episode. You'll remember his interest in nude photography. As we moved around the house, Oshin summed him up brilliantly in this passage. Henry, I mean, Henry is one of these kind of, he's a bit of a a, a mysterious character. He had a lot going on, you know. 
here in his, you know, yeah, locked up in his house in, the, in, in Roscommon in the west of Ireland with all these kind of like weird things going on and these strange kind of eccentric interests. He was a, an unusual character. His eccentricity took many forms, including his clothing. Henry had travelled the world and at parties he often wore a kimono, which he had bought in Japan, along with a conical hat common in southern and eastern Asia. Here in the corner we have, I mean, what is essentially a, a kimono, right? So it's a Japanese style dressing gown. It is really bright blue. It's embroidered with these beautiful designs in gold thread. It's this dragon pattern that goes flowing kind of all over it. Um, it's like, it's a really beautiful piece of clothing to own. And this was Henry's. So Henry Packard Mahanov's father, he bought this on his travels in Asia. He brought it back with him and he used it as a smoking jacket. So, you know, when you were smoking back then, uh, it was very common to try and you didn't want to get the smell onto your clothes. So it was common to have sort of an over jacket that you would wear. So after a dinner party ended, he would pop upstairs. He would get changed into this. He also has one of these kind of broad um, like straw hats that you often see in films in East Asia. He had that, that was also apparently something he really liked to wear on such occasions. So he would come down dressed in, you know, oriental fashion um, to smoke cigars with his guests. And again, this is all showing, look at me, I'm not so well traveled. Have you been to Japan? I've been to Japan, you know, and yeah, showing that off about how what a man of culture and, uh, and, and sophistication he is, or, or he certainly saw himself anyway. Martin Fagan, the archivist, has spent years going through the family archives. Henry's interest in photography is unusual for lots of reasons. It's not what you expect to find in a house in the west of Ireland in the late 19th century. Martin here now explains more about what Henry photographed. So he, he took photographs of um, some of family members, mainly of Olive and his wife. He took photographs of nature. So he, he liked particularly taking pictures of trees. Well, we have a few interesting, you know, black and white pictures of trees um, on, on the estate. Um, some of the house and some of the buildings. He took a lot of photographs of old paintings. So it was paintings, and that apparently was also common. So they'd go to someone else's house or they'd get a painting and they'd reproduce it and, and then put it up on the wall. So we've lots of framed pictures of old paintings of ancestors. So he was quite interested in that and I presume that was something they were swapping around. I know those pictures um, taken of paintings in Turinali uh, Castle, which was the Pakenham house. And so they were, they, were, they were taking them back here and that's what they were using as their, you know, their pictures of their, of their ancestors. Henry also had, as I mentioned in the main show, an interest in adult photography, I suppose you might say. But this wasn't just limited to taking photographs, he used to also sketch women posing in underwear. He liked drawing kind of rude pictures of, uh, of women uh, in various, not, in, not undressed, but in various poses. And I've got some sketches here. So these are his sketches. Just, just women in kind of underwear and, and that. And it was one of a man walking out to see bare chested with a, almost like Greek, with a Greek beard, with a woman over his shoulder has been carried out into the foam. And he signs his name Henry Packenamahan here. So he, but he, he kept reproducing them. So he, he makes sketches and he keeps reproducing the sketches. He also manipulates pictures. So if, he, if, he, if there's a picture with, um, oh, it was just one of, of two people dancing and he manipulates the hands, you know, to make it, make it into a rude gesture. I asked Martin why he thought Henry photographed these sketches, but why he also was photographing nude women. We heard in the last episode how he was cataloguing these photographs in a coded notebook. Martin now hypothesises that these were actually to be shared in clubs of the elite. I'm, I'm not sure exactly why he was reproducing the pictures. I suggest that it is something that was shared. Um, obviously not shared amongst everyone, but it was maybe, maybe amongst a group of gentlemen. Um, there are some other pictures which would be regarded as erotic, Edwardian erotica. Um, not that many of them, but there are some here. So some of those plates have survived too. So, In the more public realm, we've seen how some of Henry's views shaped how the Packen and Mahan family were regarded by the local community. As I mentioned in the main episode, these are evident throughout the house. You can see he's got a big portrait of William of Orange over the fireplace in the library. But when we're in the library, Ushin also took down two books that also, I suppose, flesh out Henry's political views which divided the Packenham Mahans from their neighbours in the local town of Strokestown. 
One of these was Home Rule, which I talked about in the main show. But another book revealed Henry to be deeply sectarian. He had a distrust of Catholics, who were the vast majority of the Irish population, well over 80% by 1900. Yes, exactly. And you know, this is a book that's on the shelf and it has such an eye-catching title that it was actually during a tour, uh, some tourists noticed it and was like, what? What is that about? That I took it out and, and read it for, re- began reading and realised what it was. It is entitled Paraguay on Shannon. It was written by a man called Hugh O'Donnell. Okay. And it is essentially an anti-clerical text. So basically Hugh O'Donnell is saying that the Irish priesthood is politicized and that they get too involved in politics and they're all Jacobins as he describes them. And his thesis, I suppose, is that he thinks that the priesthood has been this um, uh, regressive and very negative impact uh, influence on Ireland. So this belonged to Henry Packard and Mahon. He dates it in 1908. And he obviously really enjoyed this book because it is just full of notes and underlinings and bits he's added in So he really, uh, we can probably assume that he broadly agreed with this book. An interesting thing to note is that just after the front page, under the name of the author, Henry has added a little note to himself, I guess. So it says, by Hugh O'Donnell, M.A., and he's put in brackets, a Roman Catholic. Now to change tack onto lighter matters. When we were upstairs, Oshin brought me to Henry's bedroom. What is most striking about this is the size of the bed. It's very small compared to modern beds. It actually dates back to the early 18th century. But Oshin now explains why it was so short. You might notice it's pretty short for a bed. You often see beds in this area, they're quite short. Now that's partly because people on average were a little bit shorter back then. But the, the main reason really is that in the 18th century, there was a very commonly held belief that it was healthier to try and sleep sitting up in bed. That was quite normal. You kind of prop yourself up with a pillow and that, would, that was considered to be better for breathing and your back and things like that. So that's part of why beds are usually a little bit short. Perhaps the most influential person who didn't really feature in episode one was Olive's mother. She's only mentioned in passing. Her name was May Burrard. She was English and from a family of similar standing to the Pakenham Mahans. In the pictures of May around the house, one thing that stands out is her figure and the dresses she wore. Oshin explains... May Bard in her youth was kind of a well-known kind of famous beauty like there's stories of people kind of climbing into trees to try and see her when she was at social functions in in England. The Bird family are another kind of like fairly wealthy noble family. We have a portrait of one of her um, I think her father in the above the stairs who was a military man. The main thing that really strikes people when they look at the picture of May Bard is obviously she is a very beautiful lady um, But it's her waist, right? The waist is mad. When you look at it closely, it was supposed to be, I think, in circumference, less than 14 inches was the boast. Not very healthy. Not very healthy. I mean, you can imagine this is years of corset training, of successively tightening and tightening, tightening until you have, I mean, you could call it an hourglass shape. It's almost more extreme. It's almost like a a bee or like a, you know, an insect that goes completely in like a wasp kind of... um, body shape and you know in fairness this definitely did not do her um her health any good as you can imagine to have a figure shaped by a corset was the height of fashion but it was by all accounts extremely uncomfortable and restrictive Oshin produced a strange object that revealed just how restrictive it was people look at this and they think it's um like a magic wand it looks like a, a harry potter wand so it's basically a very nice ivory handle with a sort of a but with silver embossed, then it's a a thin tapering piece of iron at the end of the handle that ends in a tiny little hook. So yeah, this is an unusual looking thing. It is called a button hook. So essentially, if you are someone like May Berard and you're wearing a very tight corset and it's the end of a party and you're getting upstairs to get undressed and you've got your boots on, right? But if you're wearing a corset, you can't lean forward. You literally can't bend forward basically at all. So if you want to be independent to be able to get your boots off without calling for a servant, you have this item, this hook on the end of a very thin stick. You reach down and use that from a standing position to unhook the buttons on your boots without having to bend over and then you can kick them off. So this is someone who, because of the way that they dress, because of the incredibly uncomfortable and practical garments that they wear, they physically 
can barely move and can't take off their own shoes without mechanical assistance. These fashions would change during Olive's adulthood. There's another picture in the drawing room that encapsulates just how much it had changed by the opening decades of the 20th century. This is a photograph that was actually taken in Buckingham Palace. So this is in the early 30s. It is the occasion of Olive's daughter being a debutante that's presented to the Queen. This was, you know, this wasn't long before that practice actually ended, you know. She is wearing this beautiful, in fairness, gown. It's very, like, straight. It hangs off her shoulders. She's wearing a tiara with it. It is, I mean, it's, it's for the time, very fashionable. Um, it has this beautiful, almost sort of art deco kind of pattern on it. Um, and yeah, and it's completely changed even from what they would have worn in a child. You know, it's that kind of the way that it hangs on her quite loose. It's not, you know, um, billowing out from her with lots of frills and like a big train and a big um, anything like that. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's more, you can see like certainly as an adult, she was pretty up to date with the uh, fashions of the day. I mean, she would have been in her mid-30s by this point. Finally, know? the last item I want to talk about in this exclusive episode from the first day of recordings is in the toy room. There'll be more about toys in part two and three of the series, but I wanted to share with you some of the toys that Olive and her children played with that won't make it into those podcasts. The field of childhood history is relatively new. Indeed, children were generally seen but not heard in history books until very recently. But in Strokestown House, you can see a collection of the toys that Olive and, as I say, her children also played with. As you can see, the floor is literally covered in toys, in, you know, uh, uh, little cars with um, pedals, pedal cars, uh, rocking horses. There's uh, dolls, there's tea sets. I mean... Just to point out a little detail, you see there's like very nice little table, chairs, there's the dolls sitting around it. The doll tea set, that's real china and real glass, real very fine glass. You know, it's all, you had to really trust your kids back then with stuff like this. So there's uh, three pedal cars kind of in a row here. We have, I'll start with this one. So you've got this one that is clearly a model Rolls Royce. It is a very nicely made model. It has... Uh, it has a boot, it has tires, it's like, it's, it's pretty cool. This belonged to Olive's son, Nicholas, right? So this would have been in the late 30s, mid to late 30s, probably purchased. So this was Nicholas's, you know, he was the, the boy, the heir, he was spoiled. Um, we then have this smaller red one that's a little bit older that probably belonged to um, some of Olive's older children, her daughters. And then here we have actually the tallest one which is this dark green pedal chair, pedal car. Um, It's the most sort of unusual looking. It's almost hard to describe. It's almost like a little carriage. There's a very high bicycle seat, a little wheel, pedals, a very small kind of chain and axle. And this, this was Olive's as a child. So this was purchased in the 1890s. She would have used it, but it was still in use, you know, over the decades, as you can see from these photographs that we have on the mantelpiece here. So here on the right, we have Olive as a little girl, so you know, she looks maybe about 10, 11, which would put this as about 1904. She's wearing this, it almost looks like something from a horror movie. She's wearing this like big white sort of billowing dress. She's got these tiny, tiny little round sunglasses on and she's sitting on this high up pedal car. She's, as you can see, that's in front of the front steps of the house. And she's got her hair tied up with a white bow and uh, yeah, really kind of... Um, kind of how you would imagine a child in a big house back then, you know, the whole aesthetic. And then just across from it, we have a picture that would have been taken in about 1924, 25. And this is of Olive's daughter, Lettuce. Her her name was Lettuce, Olive and Lettuce, I know. Um, It was spelt as if it should be pronounced uh, Lettice, but we have recordings. They all called her Lettuce. That's what they refer to her as. So this is Lettuce. Lettuce is dressed in a kind of a, another kind of dark, big dress. She's got on uh, sort of a big kind of floppy kind of soft cap. And she is on the same pedal car. She's actually on a bridge that's out near the main gate. And she's pedaling it around. And the car still looks to be in great nick. So this is, what's that, about 
20 years or so apart, it was still being... I'm going to leave the bonus episode here, folks. I'll be back on Tuesday with part two of the main series. That takes the story into World War I and the Irish Revolution. Thanks for your support. I'm extremely grateful. I hope you're enjoying the series. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>